I had no idea the monster I had created. That's ground speed. Where's your true air speed? Top left. Are oh, you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. It's physics, math, and engineering. Machine it, draft it, build it, test it, break it. Every time something new gets built, the entire world advances. Laying in bed at night, it's designing new parts, designing new suspension, designing new wings. Turbulence from the start, initial concept, stayed really true in the engineering side. Not so much true on the power plant side, <laughs> jumping to a DAF 42 motor. I'll tell you, hang a big old motor. That is perfect. Let's fly it. Bolt the prop on. Let's go right now. Back to cowling. I'm ready. <laughs> but the engineering side, I needed to reinforce the wings. I needed to make stronger wing spars. I needed to make the wings not removable so I could add a fuel section in the D section of the wing. I needed to add a rear fuel tank. I needed to add more carbon fiber to the skin of the aircraft on both the wings, the tail. Every part of the aircraft had to become stronger. All that was all in original design. There really wasn't many changes on the original concept to the first flying version of Turbulence, which was red in color, red, silver, and black. The real changes that weren't part of the original design was let's go bigger, badder, faster, <laughs> change the motor. And at that point, we had to make a few more modifications like bigger tail section and further reinforce the front of the aircraft. It's actually a 1,090 thermal horsepower and it's 850 gearbox. What makes the difference between the thermal rating and the gearbox? The thermal rating is what the engine can actually run, the combustion side of the turbine. The gearbox has a limit of how much power you can put to it before you stress the gearbox. Typically on a turbine engine, they don't match those two. And the reason is as you take a turbine up or any normally aspirated engine up, you lose horsepower with altitude. So what they do on, with Pratt & Whitney and many turbine aircraft is they put a bigger motor coupled to a smaller gearbox and then they just limit the engine to 850 to match the gearboxes on it, and that's to save your 70 or 90 pounds that it would have weighed to do a gearbox to handle 1,090 horsepower. It's all about weight. And then they size that gearbox to where you will normally fly that aircraft. So if this aircraft was in a King Air, and it normally flew 21 to 26,000 feet, which is typically where they're flying, what horsepower could it make at that altitude? Let's make sure the gearbox can do that and that's how it's paired. So this aircraft is 1,090 horsepower. We don't use all the throttle on takeoff and quite frankly, you couldn't. I still can't use all the throttle on this aircraft on takeoff. It will turn you off the runway. So you ease into it and the faster you go, the more you can get as you get more and more aileron, rudder and control surfaces up to speed. So it evolved into a Dash 42, 850 usable and it will hold 850 into the flight level. The battery's not gonna make it. <laughs> out of work. You can't just bolt the turbine engine on the front of an airplane and fly it away. You, if you did and it worked, you're probably lucky because there's a lot more that goes on. And so as I ran into a lot of no way, too much work, too challenging, what about your laundrons, what about stiffness, what about CG, what about fuel capacity, all these monster challenges, it just turned my brain on to, well, how do I fix this? How do I fix that? And, and that's what gets me excited about a build. Anytime you're creating something that someone says you can't do, it makes the project more fun. It's, it's uh, the challenge that makes building airplanes so rewarding for me. I wish the saw could cut a funny round shape like that and my drill can't do it, so we gotta do it with the grinder, but we'll get it there, it just takes a few minutes. All right, so. We got the cuts as close as we're gonna get and rounds the pipe. 
This last little bit, I'm gonna just take and bend it and fold it around the corner and make a lot cleaner joint. So the pipe kind of has a, take a look, has lots of little S curves. It comes out at a really funny angle into a round. So this is as close as we get. We'll take a hammer, we'll roll this edge over so it blends around the back side of this and we'll weld it up. Well, it worked out perfect. You can see, we just take this edge, we're breaking it around. Now it's got a, got a real complex curve around both sides. I got a little more pounding to do to finesse it into place. I'll get it uh, up tight and touching and then we'll weld it, but we're 90% there. All right, we're getting close. Some of this coping on this really small pipe, it's easier just to get the grinder and, and round it off on the inside. I've got this side fit. And if we tuck this up in here, that should go nice and tight so you can see that fit. This one's ready to weld right here. Anyway, about four more bars and this motor mount will be done. T time to build. I get asked this a lot of how long it takes me to build an airplane. The answer is thousands and thousands of hours. And I can't get any better than that. I don't track it. I don't, quite frankly, want to track it. <laughs> I don't really want to think about how many hours. You know, I, I don't know. I have around 11,000 flight hours um, flying aircraft. And someone asked me, like, what do you like better, building or flying? And I instantly went, flying. I love to fly. And they're like, oh, really? How many hours do you have building planes? And I kind of went, I guess I love to build. Because <laughs> my hours of building to flying is a decimal point. It's a whole nother level. Because I can easily go spend an eight, eight, 10 hour day working my jobs and then come back and build, and build airplanes for another eight or 10 hours a day and I can do that back to back seven days a week. But I don't fly 10 or 12 hours a day, seven days a week for nearly a year without missing a single day. If I tracked those flight hours, it would be staggering. So um, I, don't know how, I, don't know how, I don't know how long it took to build turbulence in, in how many hours, but it took me a year to build it, a year to, to build it. Um, most of my aircraft builds have been about a year, slightly over, a couple slightly under, a couple slightly over, um, about a year. And then several months of, of, uh, of playing, and then somehow I start building something else. <laughs> it's a crazy addiction. Like it was meant for the plane. Got it. Straight out. I bit my tongue right as I looked at the camera. <laughs> Let's fly it. Bolt the prop on. Let's go right now. If the motor falls down when I unhook this, I need to stop building airplanes. <laughs> Today's finally here. It's been a long time coming. It is a massive amount of work to finally get here. So I'm really excited to be at this point. It's paint day. And uh, it took a lot to get everything ready. It took a lot to get everything masked. Um, we got it done. We're ready. Let's paint. This is one of the things we ended up doing to get this engine as high as possible. We had a problem with prop clearance. We put so much horsepower into this airplane, the prop couldn't handle it. So we had to get a bigger prop. The bigger the prop, problem was it was hitting the ground. So we raised all the gear, we raised the plane, 
But we also had to go one step further, we raised the engine up. So normally this engine would sit about this location in reference to the cowling. This is now the center location. To get the engine this high, we had to build a little adaption part right here. Underneath this hump is the control lever that runs the prop. So to change the prop RPM. So we wanted this as high as possible. So we actually made little adaptions so we could do that. I think it turned out really nice. The most important thing is I had a smaller prop on this and I had seven and a quarter inches clearance. I've now got a much bigger diameter prop and with that prop, I now have 10 and 3 16 inches. So I was down at about seven. I'm now at 10 and 3 16 So I've not only gone to a bigger prop, but I've grabbed more ground clearance. What that allows me to do is if my main strut were to blow out simultaneously while popping my front tire, both of them collapsed all the way. I would still have several inches of clearance from the ground so that if I had the most catastrophic event to the front end happen simultaneously, I still would keep that prop off the ground. So worked out really well. Any build of mine, going way back to some of the first builds when I was just taking a standard aircraft and, and leaving it mostly alone. I'm not very good at leaving it completely the way something's designed, but uh, my early first builds, I kept it mostly spec. The first flight's always the one that makes you nervous. The first flight is the one that gets your heart pumping. All right, we're going up for a test flight. This will be my first full power, full throttle, Everything's ready to go. I've gone through several little warm-up steps to get to this point, so I'm excited. This is where I find out what this bird can really do. So let's throw the hammer down and see what she does. <laughs> it's a good day. The first time I flew it, I had a, a very regimented process. How many times I'm in a taxi, and those times would increase depending on how I felt. They could never go down. And, and when I'm gonna lift it off and set it back down and stop, and when's the first time around the pattern. These are all standard practices for any flight test program. I've been test flying my planes and other people's planes for a long time. For me, the most critical part of the test flight program is mental. That's, that's mine. I think maybe some people, they're focused on aircraft systems. If this goes wrong, how does this pump relate to this pump or fuel transfer relate to this fuel transfer? And so they're studying some en other engineer's project that they're about ready to fly because it's the part that they don't completely understand. I, I couldn't study the plane anymore. I, I know every rivet, every piece of carbon, every fuel line, every fuel pressure, flow, capabilities, spinner to tail. And so I don't spend as much time on that because, um, you know, that's, that's my baby. And I, I know it like the back of my hand. The mental side of knowing you're gonna lift off the ground and you got a family waiting at home, that's, that's where I spend my attention. Because if I focus on the family that needs me home, it makes sure that the system's thought process is thorough the step-by-step -step before first liftoff, first taxi, high-speed taxi, first time you go around the pattern. I'm thinking about my family and my kids. It slows me down. It just helps me want to pace it back a little bit. And a plane that goes really, really fast, problems can happen really, really fast. And so uh, I do a lot of mental processes for weeks before my first flight. Every single flight test I do, I put on a parachute. That's just standard practice. I also bring out the fire department. I have cars parked around at various places if I'm gonna be around the pattern. There's fields that are in the area. and We have a lot of safety staff that are fortunately friends of mine from Search and Rescue and, and the police department.
the taxiing for the first time and ramping up the throttle. That one, that one, that one was a rush because it, it was only after a few taxi tests doing the brake check, speed checks, reverse calibration for the turboprop because you can go into reverse and make sure it's in the right location so that you actually could fly it and come around the pattern and slow down and not have it go in reverse and stall you, you know. There's a lot of taxiing just about setting up the prop. Get past all that easy stuff, you know, that's just groundwork. When I started ramping up how much power and doing high-speed taxi, <laughs> I quickly realized that I could steer the airplane with my foot all the way on the floor and changing the throttle to control its direction of high-speed taxi, that was pretty exciting because I realized that I will never lift off this airplane at full throttle, ever, at any race. There's more power than you have controlled the handle. The first high-speed taxi was really fun. And then first flight, oh my gosh. I've flown some hot rods. I've had already set some transcontinental speed records and, and been air racing for a long time. Um, the first time I got up and was able to continue the throttle up as I had control surfaces to do it, and my airspeed is just rocket shipping off the top as I'm pulling more and more deck angle, I had no idea the monster I had created <laughs> until that first time getting it out and getting to start rolling the throttle up. And even on the first flight, I never got it to full speed, but I felt it going there and I looked how much needle was left and the airspeed I was doing and the deck angle it was holding, um, that's when I knew I created something special, something <laughs> that could smoke my jet, it could smoke anything I'd ever flown. I couldn't wait to go through weeks more of testing until I could see where that envelope really was. Whoa, 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 whoa. Is that, that's ground speed. Where's your true air speed? Top left. Very top. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. If you step oh, look, on the wait, ball, look, look at it. You're going to outrun the Jets. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. That's level. That's oh. only 17,500 feet. <laughs> oh, oh my god. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's the world's fastest single engine turboprop, isn't it? No doubt about it. 100%. Like by a lot. Crap. I You're getting pretty dang close to world's fastest hero problem ever. Period. That's 420 mile an hour cruise Whoa. at, at normal temps at 17,500 feet. No, you just go to 25,000 and see <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Holy I used to allow a lot of people come to flight tests, and I don't anymore. Matter of fact, I, I have, I couldn't have swung more polar opposite. I used to have uh, dozens and dozens of people that I didn't even know come to watch me do a flight test. I realized after a few of those that uh, I think it's a bad idea. I know other people may do it. I, whatever works for you is great. but. I talked to other, a couple other um, well-known builders that have designed and built a lot of aircraft. Um, they have the same belief I do now that evolved over time and you don't want anybody there. You want safety personnel, maybe your immediate family, the absolute criticals if things are going to go wrong. And that's it. And so for me, the safest thing is to have your head clear, 50 cameras pointing at you of strangers, as much as I'd like to think it doesn't affect me or any other test pilot, it does. It makes you not as safe as you could be. So that, that idea of the people you're around in aviation, especially after my Draco crash, 
It was before that, but it kind of carries along with the people that you are around in aviation. I no longer fly with people that encourage someone to push their envelope. I'm not saying I had a lot of people like that. I, I really didn't. I'm not, I don't want to be negative or people to think I'm, that, that was a group I flew with. But um, I'm very aware of making sure I'm not that person. And I'll give you an example. You know, flying any of my planes, but particular uh, bush plane up onto a hilltop called Not For You. Named Not For You for a reason. Because the majority of airplanes, it's just not for you to get in and out. There were several very capable aircraft circling like buzzards. We kind of joke they're buzzards while the others are on the ground. I wanted to make sure that I'm the guy that says, if you don't feel good, I'm going to high five you and give you a hug and say, good job for not doing it. So in my flight test program, I want the people that talk me out of flying it, not the people that talk me into flying the program around me. I, I want, I'd rather people pull back. Um, I push my envelope and it cost me. It could have cost me my life.